Welcome back to the Naval News. I'd like to thank Fume for sponsoring today's video. More about them in a second. Uh, we have some great information for you today. I went through and dug up all the open source information I could find on the most recent Chinese carrier deployment into the Philippine Sea in December of last year. And uh, we're gonna bring you those details today. But first, a big update. Uh, I had put out on Twitter a request to the OSINT community to confirm a major flight deck incident. And I got a lot of responses Every one of them uh, was negative, including a recent photo showing no visible damage to the flight deck. So no major flight deck incident occurred during this deployment. If it did occur, it must have been during a previous one. Uh, this ship has been around now for a little while and it, they most certainly have had some sort of incident during their training, but it was not in the uh, recent deployment to the Philippine Sea. All right, now a word from our sponsor. I would like to thank Fume for sponsoring today's video. You know, it might surprise you to find out that this old sailor has a few bad habits. My main vice really is snacking. All day long, if I see potato chips or something like this muffin laying around, well, it's not gonna last long. Well, now with Fume, instead of reaching for that snack, I can reach for this. Fume is a non-electrical natural diffuse device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade your negative habit for a positive one. Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. Fume is small enough to carry with you. It fits in your pocket or even your smallest bag. I love how tactile it feels for those of us who like to use our hands. My favorite is the maple flavor. It tastes great and has helped me put the muffin down. I want you to go to tryfume.com forward slash subbrief and use my code subbrief to save 10% off when you get the journey pack. Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and a new version two fume to help you kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfum.com and use the code subbrief to save an additional 10% off on your order today. And welcome back. So in December, uh, the PLAN, that's the People's Liberation Army Navy, uh, goes to sea with a major carrier force supported by two Type 55 uh, destroyers and their Leoning uh, you know, ski jump ramp aircraft carrier, and they go through the first island chain and conduct operations for two weeks in the Philippine Sea. So let's begin with September 16th. This is when they transit through the island chain. And the reason why we know this information in such detail is Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force was tracking them and keeping an eye on them the entire way. And they made a lot of this public. Uh, and as tip of the hat to all the other OSINT sources out there, including the United States Naval Institute, Appreciate you guys very much. So this is the approximate position of the carrier group on December 16th, kind of east and southeast of Okinawa. Uh, they were observed conducting bar cap, you know, flight operations uh, in the direction of Okinawa as if to defend, you know, from any um, potential threat coming in that direction. Typical stuff that you would see in a naval operation. Uh, the real problem with this deployment is that they don't have a capable um, carrier-based airborne uh, early warning radar system. They do have the J-18 helicopter that you see here. That's a small helicopter above the yellow circle. And the yellow circle represents the approximate range of its radar. It's very limited when compared to say the American E-2 Hawkeyes that we deploy off of our carriers. So uh, right away we can see that do, they do have a limited horizon of detection with their airborne radars. And they of course have a limited number of airplanes compared to American aircraft carriers on, on their uh, aircraft carrier here. And they observed a very low rate of sorties. We're talking 15 to 20 sortie launches and recoveries traps a day, you know, compared to the United States, we'll do that in an hour, you know. So very low rate of sorties, but this just confirms that this was a training exercise that they were doing for two weeks in the Philippine Sea. During that time, they moved south towards Guam and uh, did bar cap, you know, simulation and operation in the direction of Guam, simulating a defense from, from, that, de from that direction as well. And this lasted until December 27th, where they then began heading back to home port and they got past the first island chain into the East China Sea by uh, January 1st of, uh, of this year. So again, we did see a large number of helicopter sorties though. So including the Z-18 AEW aircraft uh, helicopter uh, and, and others as well. So 
really more of a helicopter operation at this point than aircraft, but they are practicing and getting better with their J-15 carrier-borne aircraft. This whole operation was heavily supported by ground-based bombers. The H-6 is, uh, you know, the Swiss Army knife of bombers. They have more variants of this thing than you can shake a stick at. Uh, everything from anti-ship to conventional bomber to nuclear bomber, and there's different variations of those as well. And so uh, this is the uh, approximate route and the range of their surface-based, surface search rather, air-based radar on one of their variants. I believe it's the Delta that has the surface search radar. So I kind of outlined that area where the radar could look if they took this direct path from their uh, from the mainland China directly to the fleet and then back again. This just gives you an idea of where they could look around electronically. And keep in mind, that's a surface search radar, not an air search radar. Uh, I would imagine these bombers are escorted from ground-based aircraft fighter, multi-role fighters as well. I could not confirm that, so I did not include that here, but we should you know, include that possibility as well. So this is really what it looked like uh, the last two weeks of December. These operations from ground-based uh, mainland uh, aircraft were happening daily, going out to the uh, uh, fleet and then back, you know, day after day. So a rather large operation. You can see they're practicing their capability, their, uh, you know, target data link sharing between multiple domains of air, sea. Uh, there were submarines involved, but I don't know their uh, location, so we didn't add them here to the graphic. We assume with the fleet, but you don't know, never know. They can be way out in front of the fleet as well. And something that most people are not aware of, in uh, 2016, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences made public, and this is something that we kind of knew about before, but it was finally publicly released, that they had uh, floor or seabed mounted acoustic arrays within 500 kilometers of Guam. I've put their uh, approximate position here. The green circle is their uh, probable detection range based on low frequency uh, SOSIS performance. So if they're capable at all, um, oh, and I should say that the public reason for these arrays is to measure temperature and salinity, which they can also do. That's the science and civilian aspect of it. But they also have a rather large acoustic array on them. You know, I wonder why they have that there. Well, it's so that they can hear submarines and ships operating in the vicinity of Guam. We know of two of these, thus the two green circles that overlap. And each one of those sensors can detect, you know, submerged frequencies, we'll just put it that way, and it gives the operator a pie slice, a very narrow pie slice, depending on the frequency, of the direction that that's going. And by having two of them, those two pie slices cross each other, giving them a little operational box of the probable location of a frequency source submerged or surfaced. So that's how that works. We know that there's at least two, there could be more, and they're putting a lot of these in the South China Sea. That's a whole nother topic. We'll get to that. But between the seabed-based acoustic arrays, the air-based radars coming out of the mainland, and the carrier operations that went on for two weeks in the Philippine Sea, this is the full complement and capability of the PLAN right now. They're operating past the first island chain. This is actually the second time this year they did this. They did this back in May as well. A little bit closer to Taiwan then, uh, but they're a lot closer to Guam this time. All right, so let's talk a little bit about their operational limitations and capabilities. As you can see here, uh, they're still struggling with air search radar range. You know, they do, they do have that helicopter, that little... Uh, array on the bottom there that rotates up and down. Obviously, whenever they're in flight, they rotate it down, it transmits. It's basically a radar hanging on the bottom of the Z-18 but they're gonna replace that. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, they, they also have a very low sortie rate, 15 to 20 planes a day, which is definitely training level or just practicing. Uh, they do require land-based aircraft support if they're gonna defend themselves, thus the H-6 and the escorts uh, presumably with them. And surprisingly, and well, not surprisingly, they the max speed that was measured uh, during this entire operation was 25 knots, and oftentimes it was much less than that. One, they didn't have anywhere to go in a hurry, so that's a big part of that. But there could be a limitation in one of these ships, and I really think it's the supply support ship, uh, has a max speed of approximately 25 knots. And again, this aircraft carrier is very old. Even though it was commissioned in 2012 in the Chinese Navy, remember, it came all the way from Ukraine decades ago. So this, this aircraft carrier has a long history of trouble, uh, especially with its prime movers. So 
It could be that the carrier itself is the speed limiting factor here, not just the support chip that I believe is limited to 25 knots. Now, some positives, some capabilities that they did demonstrate is they can operate past that first island chain for weeks. They've done it twice uh, in 2022. The J-15 aircraft can hold something like 20,000 uh, pounds of fuel. That's an enormous amount of gas. So she has very long range. It is believed that during this carrier operation, as long as they maintained more than half of their gas on board, if they could not capture a, a, a plane on the aircraft carrier, they would have enough fuel to make it all the way back to mainland China if they did it at high altitude and low speed, you know, cruising. Um, and so that was probably what was going on there. They probably never burned more than half their capable onboard gas uh, just as a backup. Uh, they do have multi-domain warfighting capability. They demonstrated that by bringing out the bombers. There were submarines involved, subsea, surface, airborne uh, capability. And finally, they were data link sharing between uh, the surface ships and the H-6s. They observed that as well. So pretty modern capability. They're practicing. They're getting better. China is definitely here as a blue water Navy, and they're getting better. Because what do they have now? Well, in uh, June of 2022, they launched the Type 003 aircraft carrier. And this thing is very modern and is built to today's standards, including uh, the electromagnetic catapult system that you see there under the black tents. There's three of them total. Also has a much larger deck and obviously doesn't have the ski jump ramp. So they're actually catapulting planes into the air now, which means they can deliver planes with a much larger uh, load, more bombs, more fuel, larger airplanes like this one. They copied our E2 Deltas, uh, China. This is the KJ 600. And uh, they've been trying to figure out how they can increase their airborne, airborne early warning systems. And they've done it. This thing is capable, supposedly, of being launched from the Type 03, 003 carrier. And uh, that is going through sea trials now before it's commissioned. So we're looking forward to more information on this. But they straight up ripped off our E2 Hawkeyes uh, by, by appearance. So I want you to take a look at the future here. This is from the year 2000 going out to 2030. This is uh, the growth of China's maritime forces. And this also matches their shipbuilding capability. There's been a lot of talk about, um, to me, about how their sailors are not experienced. That changes with every deployment and it's been changing for years. We can no longer hang our hat on, well, their sailors aren't as good as ours, therefore they're not as capable. Well, they're becoming more and more capable all the time. They're also doing something the United States is not doing and they're investing a ton of money and manpower into ship building. They're increasing their shipbuilding capability across their entire seaboard. And it's, it's reflected here in the number of ships that they're building every year. They already have the largest Navy in the world, if you count their maritime militia and Chinese Coast Guard as well, which you should because they treat them as if they're military ships. The, uh, the maritime militia, if you will, basically paid fishermen to go out and uh, squat or settle in the vicinity of a specific, you know, say an atoll in the South China Sea for 280 days a year. And that's, you know, de, de facto claiming that water space. They have a large number of ships that are subsidized by the government just to do that alone. The Coast Guard, Chinese Coast Guard operates all over the world. And as you can see here, the PLAN is growing every year. And uh, this, no, this shows no sign of slowing down. They're becoming more and more capable all the time. And I think it's time for us in the West to stop making excuses as to why we're better because they've come up with technologies that we haven't mastered yet. A big one is the hypersonic missile race. Russia has demonstrated the ability to put that at sea. It's at sea right now on one of the Corvettes. Uh, China probably got their technology from them, but we don't know. The fact is both those countries have operating hypersonic weapons and the United States is still trying to get ours up and running. We just this year in 2022 got a successful test done. OK, so now we're going to start deploying them, but we're behind on that. So if you say, well, China steals its technology, well, they didn't steal it from us because we didn't have it. And it doesn't matter how they got it. The fact is they have it now. This is the Chinese Navy today. It's very capable. Uh, it's a blue water Navy and they're getting better. And this new aircraft carrier, it, its capability appears to be very similar to the Nimitz class. Now, it's not nuclear powered, but that doesn't matter. What matters is sortie rate. And it has the, the increased deck space to improve that sortie rate from the 20 a day that it is now to the 20 an hour the United States has set as a standard. 
Okay, this is what we expect to see uh, between now and the 20 and in, in, into 2030. All right, so I look forward to your comments. Leave them down below. Thanks again, Fume, for sponsoring this video, and we will see you next time. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.